Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at choosewood.com. It's Wednesday, May 3rd. This is the 1,000th edition of The Gateway. More on that in a few minutes. I'm Wayne Pratt. Leaders throughout the St. Louis region want industries like geospatial, advanced manufacturing, and technology to become staples of the area's economy. They need more trained workers in those sectors to make that a reality. If you want to attract economic development to the area, one of the selling points is that we have talent. In just a few minutes, St. Louis Public Radio's Eric Schmidt will report on the state of workforce development across the region. Attorney General Andrew Bailey's effort to oust St. Louis Circuit Attorney Kim Gardner will go forward. St. Louis Public Radio's Jason Rosenbaum reports. Judge John Torbitsky denied most of Gardner's efforts to dismiss Bailey's case. He said that the allegations that she, among other things, mismanaged her office and created a toxic work environment, quote, gives rise to a reasonable inference that Gardner has intentionally failed to act contrary to a known duty. Torbitsky granted Gardner's request to switch judges, which means a different person will preside over a trial that's slated to begin in September. The Missouri Supreme Court will choose the replacement judge, and if that person kicks Gardner out of office, she can appeal to the Supreme Court, and there's nothing stopping her from running for another term in 2024. I'm Jason Rosenbaum, St. Louis Public Radio. A bill to put the St. Louis Police Department under state control has stalled in the Missouri Senate. The measure would also allow the governor to appoint a special prosecutor for violent crime cases. The Missouri Independent reports a nine-hour Democratic filibuster prompted Republicans to set the bill aside last night. Democrats say the measure is politically motivated and ignores calls for stricter gun laws. Republicans say the steps are needed to deal with crime in St. Louis. Missouri representatives and senators will meet today to begin finalizing the upcoming state budget. As St. Louis Public Radio's Sarah Kellogg reports, language against diversity, equity, and inclusion is not likely to reappear in the final package. Representative Doug Ritchie, the sponsor of that language on the House side, said to his knowledge there will not be pressure to reinstate that language this year. However, that doesn't mean it won't be introduced in future sessions. I'm still convinced that it's it's entirely appropriate to do that through the budget, but I also am equally um, uh, committed to doing that through a statutory uh, route as well. Either one is fine for me. Lawmakers have until Friday to send the budget to the governor's office. There is currently a $4.2 billion difference between the chamber's proposed budgets, with the Senate spending more money. In Jefferson City, I'm Sarah Kellogg, St. Louis Public Radio. St. Louis County Council members could be in line for a big pay increase. A compensation commission is recommending an increase from $20,000 a year to $40,000. Council chairpersons would receive $50,000. Former County Council aide David Stokes is now with the public policy think tank, the Show Me Institute. He says the pay boost proposal is too steep. And while, again, the pandemic changed that and they all had sort of a really high workload for the last few years, I think it's going to revert to the more normal order of things. And I think $40,000 a year and 50 for the chair is, is way too high. If approved, the salary increase would not go into effect until the terms of all current council members expire. An Illinois jury has convicted four former ComEd executives and lobbyists of bribing former House Speaker Michael Madigan. Jurors found former ComEd CEO Anne Premajore, former executive John Hooker, and lobbyists Michael McLean and Jay Doherty guilty on all counts. Reporter Dave McKinney was in the courtroom yesterday when the verdict came down. One by one, as the counts were being read, the defendants sat in the courtroom emotionless. Uh, Family members uh, from all the defendants were there. uh, And and afterwards, uh, you know, in the hallway, it was a very emotional scene here in the Dirksen Federal Building. Uh, Family members of uh, McLean, who was a a longtime confidant of former House Speaker Michael Madigan, uh, were in tears. Prosecutors detailed a scheme that involved the four defendants hiring Madigan allies and associates in exchange for favorable legislation in Springfield. Investigators now say seven people died in this week's crashes along I-55 in Illinois, south of Springfield, involving about 80 vehicles. Most of the vehicles stranded because of the crashes are being released today. Low visibility from dust blowing off nearby farm fields led to the crashes. 
Authorities had to shut down a section of I-55 again yesterday because of the blowing dust. Maplewood has settled a class action lawsuit by residents who say they were kept in jail because they didn't have money. Advocates for reform say improvements to the judicial system are still needed. Plaintiff Frank Williams spent weeks in jail for minor unpaid municipal citations. He says the roughly $3 million settlement does not solve any problems. No, that don't feel like no victory to me. I'm glad it, it got settled, though. But that's not no victory because they still got to straighten out the prejudice. We got to get rid of that. It'll be better for everybody. Williams made the comments on St. Louis on the Air. Arch City Defenders has similar suits proceeding against Ferguson and Florissant. Regional leaders in St. Louis are betting on industries like geospatial and advanced manufacturing to drive economic growth in the next decade. They will require more workers, and there's movement to expand and develop training opportunities for local residents. St. Louis Public Radio's Eric Schmidt reports on efforts to build the new workforce. Inside a machining lab at Southwestern Illinois College, student Aiden Johnson prepares the equipment that's about to transform a block of aluminum into a specialized part. He fastens a few drill bits into larger cartridges before loading them into the CNC mill. Johnson then calibrates the machine, checks the program he wrote one last time, before the drill spins up and starts shaving away chunks of aluminum. Johnson is learning precision machining, which he says has captivated him. CNC is just a really cool concept. I love watching it work and I love programming it. It's a lot of fun. He adds the machining process is not as complicated as he first expected it would be. Mark Bosworth, Swix Industrial Technology Coordinator, says the equipment uses the same concepts from graphing in a math class. That's how these machines operate, X, Y, and Z coordinates. Bosworth says those three inputs give a CNC machine all the information it needs to produce components for airplanes, parts for dental or eye surgeries, and other contexts. He says these machines are the starting point for basically anything that's manufactured these days. Bosworth says that makes students at SWIC, like Johnson, in high demand. Right now there's probably three or five job opportunities each week of companies calling in to ask for our students to get hired at their companies. This demand is poised to grow even more in the coming years, since St. Louis won a $25 million federal grant last year to expand its advanced manufacturing industry. That money pays for a new innovation center in St. Louis, training facilities at SWIC and St. Louis Community College, and other programs to train this workforce, like those at Rung for Women. Leslie Gill is that organization's president, which helps women in the St. Louis region to transition into careers in technology, advanced manufacturing, and geospatial. Certain sectors, for sure, like manufacturing, we're going to start to see this trend of folks aging out, moving into retirement, and there really hasn't been a concerted effort to position the sector as growth, as a growth sector for the region. Gill says there are many good paying opportunities that don't require years of education in the sectors her organization trains women for. She says it's important the St. Louis area establishes strong talent pipelines before the region's bet on manufacturing and geospatial industries begin to pay off in a few years. That's when the new NGA campus and Advanced Manufacturing Innovation Center will both open in North St. Louis. We want to have a line of folks, you know, waiting to respond to these job opportunities. Uh, we don't want the job opportunities to post and then you have to go find people. The region's ability to provide these workers has implications on its long-term economic development strategy. Jill Bernard Bracey is the acting director of UMSL's Supply Chain Risk and Resilience Research Institute. If you want to attract economic development to the area, one of the selling points is that we have talent for you to bring whatever your respective business industry here we have the talent to supply to you. Bracey says anticipating what different industries will need in the coming years should drive training options today. She adds that makes it easier to react and stay ahead of changing conditions. This may be more challenging for St. Louis's tech scene because the industry needs many more workers. We currently have over 38,000 open tech jobs. 
that we can't fill. Emily Hemingway is the executive director of Tech STL, which advocates on behalf of the local data economy. She says it's imperative the St. Louis region finds a way to double its tech workforce, and fast. Hemingway says this will mean attracting talent from outside the region, but she would rather these opportunities go to people already living in the area. Frankly, the St. Louis residents don't have as fair of a shot at landing these jobs. And we need to fix that. Hemingway says it may take 10 to 20 years to really make that change. She says it will be difficult for the region to keep up without an aggressive plan to both train people today and develop long-term avenues into the sector. I'm Eric Schmidt, St. Louis Public Radio. Our Brian Moline edited that report. Before wrapping up, it's a milestone edition of The Gateway, the 1,000th episode. This weekday extravaganza started on a spring day roughly four years ago. It's Monday, May 13th. I'm Wayne Pratt. Ahead. Since that day in May 2019, we've reported on the big stories in the region, including the pandemic. Lockdown started in March 2020. At the time, County Executive Sam Page said the moves would slow the outbreak and make sure hospitals could help the sickest patients. We need to make sure that our hospitals have the capacity to take care of them. So it's very important that we spread this out over time and that we slow the infection down as it spreads through our community. We still have not fully bounced back from mask wearing and working at home. Another big story came in June 2022 when the U.S. Supreme Court reversed the landmark Roe v. Wade decision. We will win! I believe that we will win! That's hundreds of abortion rights supporters converging on Planned Parenthood in St. Louis's Central West End in the hours after the decision. Our Sarah Kellogg set the scene in Jefferson City, where anti-abortion activists celebrated outside the state Supreme Court. It was Missouri's Attorney General Eric Schmidt who signed the opinion required in order to put the state's trigger law banning almost all abortions into effect. Hours later, around 50 anti-abortion activists gathered to celebrate the victory through a The decision has prompted women from Missouri and other states to go to Illinois clinics where the procedure is still legal. We've been on top of government scandals. Rachel Littman was our go-to reporter when a big one hit St. Louis City Hall in June 2022. In a 66-page indictment, prosecutors outline a complicated scheme in which a local convenience store owner gave Reed, the board president, and Alderman Boyd and Collins Muhammad cash, cars, and car repair in exchange for their help on development projects. All three were Reed sentenced by the end of that year. The region was on edge as residents awaited a verdict in the trial of a white Minnesota police officer charged with killing a black man, George Floyd. Many St. Louis activists were relieved and elated now that Derek Chauvin has been found guilty of murder. But they're quick to point out the work is far from finished. That's former St. Louis public radio reporter Kayla Drake. Chauvin was sentenced to slightly more than 20 years in prison for killing Floyd. And we were there when tragedy hit home with the shooting at Central Visual and Performing Arts High School in St. Louis. Hundreds of people gathered at the park's Roman Pavilion to grieve and remember the fallen teacher and student, along with seven others who were injured. 16-year-old Alex Macias says he was in class when his health teacher, Jean Kushka, was shot and killed. That's our Chad Davis reporting. 15-year-old Alexandria Bell was also killed in that shooting. Friends and family described her as bright and energetic with a strong personality. We've also focused on the unique experiences in the region, like when Shayla Farzan took us up on the St. Louis Wheel just before it opened in 2019. We can look down into the metal scaffolding that's sort of holding up the roof of Union Station Entertainment Complex right now. But then kind of as we continue going up, you get this amazing view of the St. Louis skyline. So you have the Arch and Stiefel Theater and the Enterprise Center and Bush Stadium, all kind of a a bird's eye view of everything from the top here. There was Jonathan All's visit to a vacuum cleaner convention and museum in Rolla. Alex Terzuola came from Denver and said the shop is the Taj Mahal of vacuum collections. This beautiful display here, it's really worth visiting and seeing everything lined up just perfect and everything you can go through like, it's like a time capsule for different decades. And Jeremy Goodwin's visit with Chase Park Plaza cinema organist Jerry Marion. Been here going on 20 years. It's something part of my life. (laughs) I just love doing. Before most evening screenings, 
the bright-eyed 70-year-old sits by the screen and plays his electric con organ for about 20 minutes. And during the Blues Stanley Cup run in 2019, now retired reporter Mary Leonard introduced us to another organist, Jeremy Boyer. I think it's very cool not only to be the organist of the St. Louis Blues, but to be the organist of the only team in all of professional sports that has a musical note as their logo. The team was named for the classic melody, the St. Louis Blues, written by W.C. Handy in 1914. No mention of the Blues is complete without talking about Charles Glenn. He retired as the team's full-time national anthem singer following the Stanley Cup victory. I'm singing for all my relatives who fought in the war wars, the civil wars, civil rights. All of that just scratches the surface of what we've covered in 1,000 episodes of The Gateway. Several people go into making this weekday extravaganza. Some have moved on from the station. A big thanks to them, and a big thanks to our current reporter roster. Bear with me, because here we go. Jonathan All, who is also one of our editors. Marissa Ann Lewis-Thompson, Chad Davis, Rachel Lippman, Kate Grumke, Will Bauer, Sarah Kellogg, Sarah Fenton, Jeremy Goodwin, Andrea Henderson, Eric Schmid, Jason Rosenbaum, Brian Munoz, who is also our newsroom photographer, Lara Hamden, and Brent Jones, who was our data journalist. Our editors, Brian Heffernan, Brian Moline, Fred Ehrlich, David Casares, and Bob Cronin. Our St. Louis on the Air team, Alex Hoyer, Aaron Dorr, Elaine Cha, Maya Norfleet, Danny Wisentowski, and Emily Woodbury. Ashley Listenby is our news director. No version of The Gateway is complete without a mention of Ryan McNeely of Adult Fur. He put together our theme music and has been with us since day one. And maybe, just maybe, one day I'll actually meet the guy. And thanks to you for downloading or listening on stlpr.org. St. Louis Public Radio is a listener-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Happy anniversary, Jenny. I'm Wayne Pratt. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at choosewood.com.